Aloha, I'm Eva Andrade. I'm the president and CEO of Hawaii Family Farm. And on today's episode of Faith in Politics, we're going to talk about intimate partner violence. So let's chat about that. Aloha, everybody. I'm Eva Andrade. I am the president and CEO of Hawaii Family Forum. And today we're going to actually talk about intimate partner violence. And in order to do that, we have to have a special guest that can share his manao specifically on that issue. And so today we have Reverend Al Miles, and I'd like to introduce you to him. Welcome, Reverend Al. Eva, thank you for having me on the show. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I know that you wear a couple of hats, and so we'll get into that. Um, but I want to let our viewers know that we have an author in our midst. He has written four books, and I'm going to share with you the title of those books right now. The first one is Domestic Violence, What Every Pastor Needs to Know. And there are two editions of that book. So pastors, if you're watching this, we're going to give you the opportunity later to know how to get your hands on this book. Another one is Violence in Families what every Christian needs to know. So viewer, regardless of what hat you're wearing, that might be a book you might be interested in. And finally, something that I think a lot of us, especially those that have um, youth in their homes, Ending Violence in Teen Dating Relationships, a resource guide for parents and pastors. And um, Reverend Miles, he's been an ordained minister with the Church of God since 1983. So again, we welcome you to the show today. Thank you very much. So um, why don't you um, introduce yourself to our viewers so they get a little bit of an idea of who you are. Yes, thank you very much. Aloha, everyone. I'm the Reverend Al Miles, as Eva has said. For the past 27 and a half years, I've served with an organization here on Oahu called Pacific Health Ministry. We place chaplains throughout Oahu and on the islands of Maui and Kauai. And I serve as the lead chaplain at the Queens Medical Center in downtown Honolulu. Uh, we have um, a great friend over there at Queens Medical Center, and I don't know if he'll be watching this, but you can let him know that we're saying aloha to um, Dr. Daniel Fishberg. Uh, Dr. Daniel Fishberg, very good colleague, very good friend of mine as well. Yeah, we, we go a long way back too. So. So again, the topic we're talking about today is intimate partner violence. And I think that maybe the easiest way that we can start this discussion is to, you know, what exactly is adults' intimate violence? It's a, it's a pattern of assaultative and abusive behavior. And in that pattern, offenders use different type of tactics to get what they want when they want it. And so it's a very important to understand it as a pattern. It's not about somebody being upset. It's not about somebody losing it. Not about someone saying I was pushed and pushed so I couldn't take it anymore. Mm -hmm. It's an ongoing pattern and tactics that are used are those that are coercive and they're threatening and their tactics to get what they want when they want it. To break that down, there are emotional abuse tactics, psychological abuse tactics, sexual abuse tactics, and spiritual abuse tactics. And the goal is always for the offender to get what they want when they want it. It's a, it's a tactic of power and control. And we've heard a lot about this, especially during the COVID-19 lockdowns. You know, I know that even in just conversations that I've had with people, we've talked about how because people were forced to be locked up in their homes, that there was a little bit more of a rise to this. Yes. Do you want to address that maybe a little bit? We can address that right now. We can get into other things after that. Because of the pandemic and people were ordered to stay at home to shelter in place, then the, the victim survivor has no place to go. And oftentimes, and I'm gonna use the female pronoun, yes, there are men who can be abused and are abused in uh, heterosexual partnerships by their female intimate partners and in same gender loving partnerships by their male intimate partners. But the great majority, the vast majority, more than 80% of the cases victim survivors are female, and more than 90% of the cases, offenders are male. 
when the pandemic occurred and still occurring, obviously, uh, they're sheltered in the same place. So a victim survivor who may have had time to escape, may have had a place that she could go to be with friends away from the offender, all of a sudden is sheltered and locked up in the home and thus increases the, the, the danger, the risk factors in a victim survivor being harmed by her offender. You know, a lot of people, when they're um, talking about intimate partner violence, they may or may not know whether somebody in their, their circle is being affected by something like this. I mean, right. are there signs that we should be looking for um, in our friends and family? Sure. People ask me that all the time, Eva. One of the, one of the signs that I always say is that the person is acting differently than she or he has previously acted. Someone, for example, who has been a very outgoing person suddenly seems withdrawn. Someone who really uh, loved, as many people do here in the islands, loved the, the touch, the hug, suddenly we reach out to touch them. And I'm not talking about the pandemic, I'm talking about even previous to that. Suddenly we reach out to touch her and she draws back. She seems hypersensitive. Um, someone who has unexplained bruises or the comments that are made, what happened to your eye, for example, she gives a, a, a reason that is not believable. One of the best examples I, I, I can recall right now happened several years ago on Oahu. And, you know, our temperatures, the low temperatures at best will be in the 60s, the high temperatures in the 90s. And a woman walked into my office and she was limping uh, pretty severely. And I said, sister, what happened to your leg? She said, oh, I slipped on a patch of ice. And then she caught herself and said, uh, I mean a crack. I, I, I mean a hole. And when she had lived in a cold weather climate, she could use that excuse a lot. I slipped on ice. Realizing that she was in Hawaii, she then told me, she said, my husband beat me. So, so, so it's, it's going to be those kind of things. The bruises are unexplained or the reasons for the bruises. You know, I'm such a clux. So therefore I slipped on a bar of soap and I, I hurt my head or I bumped my head or I broke my arm. Um, the other kind of things, the, 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 what I always talk about is the bruises that we can't see are even more scarring a lot of times. It's the emotional, psychological abuse. Someone who claims to love us and calls us demeaning names. Someone that puts us down, says that we're stupid, makes comments about our weight, whether, whether the weight is overweight, underweight, whatever, makes comments, uh, makes comments about our appearance. And I'm talking about derogatory comments. I'm not talking about uh, nice comments. Someone once said, you said, you said Reverend Miles, uh, not to call people out of their name, but I always refer to my, my, my wife as honey and baby and sweetheart. I said, I don't think any lover would mind that. But it's other comments like stupid and dumb and, and, and very demeaning comments that we're talking about that really does uh, scar the soul a lot of times. So it's so you know, Yeah, and I think that what's scary is that the bruising you know, and seeing, you know, the recoiling back of when you're reaching out to give someone a hug, those things are, are a little bit more obvious, right? Yes. Than yes. the abuse that could be taking place, as you just mentioned, where, yes. you know, there is this, this constant berating of somebody to where yes. they get to the point where they have no faith in themselves anymore. And they're so broken. Um, so I really appreciate that you're, you're calling attention to that because I think sometimes we pay more attention to what's on the surface and we may not be knowing what's happening below the surface. Well, in fact, knowing your audience as, as a, a, a group of a Christian sisters and brothers, a lot of times Christian folks will say, well, I saw no bruises, so she's not being abused. And I said, oh, you just named one tactic. And a lot of times that tactic is a later entry tactic, if it occurs at all. 
I said a lot of emotional and psychological and spiritual abuse has occurred long before there's physical violence. And that's the ones that, like I said, are scarring. Uh, for example, telling someone that they're worthless. Mm. Or one guy referred to his wife as, as a double wide. Mm. And, okay. and it's just, it was very demeaning, disrespectful, by the way. And I don't think I'll surprise you at all that this occurs within as well as outside of Christian homes. So, so even, even Christians are being abused by other people who claim to be Christians. So it's not something out there somewhere. It happens within, which brings us to spiritual abuse. It's the misuse of God and Christ and divine, other divine beings and sacred text uh, to, to claim some kind of lordship, headship over uh, an intimate partner, a female intimate partner. So, so it's, it's the man who says that you have to have sex with me whenever because I am your head and you are my servant. Well, the scriptures don't say that at all. Uh, it's the man that says I have a right to do whatever I want to because I am the head of the household. And the scriptures in Ephesians that talk about head of the household really carries with it a sense of responsibility. And that head means that I will be responsible to everyone and I will serve everyone. But it's been misinterpreted to say that all of a sudden I can do what I want and I can even have sex with my wife when I want, even if she says no, which in legal terms is rape. But a lot of the men who do that say, no, it's not. It's my Christian right. And that's, again, misguided. So there's a lot of things other than the physical stuff that occurs in fact, many survivors have taught me over the years that it's the emotional, the psychological, and the spiritual. That kind of abuse scars them because, the, the, as you've talked about, the physical battering, which I condemn, by the way, but the physical battering usually will heal. The emotional, psychological, and spiritual will remain, and, and that's what makes it so tough. Yeah, and it's interesting because I know that in the past, too, when the issue of this kind of violence would come up, people would say, well, my pastor would recommend that I go back into this relationship and right. submit to my husband. I right. mean, do you see those kind of things still happening today, or, or are we getting a little bit better? I, I certainly would love to report we're getting better, but we're not. In certain circles, that is still the justification that he has a right to do what he wants when he wants to with his wife. And I will point out what the scriptures mean. When I'm talking to pastors, I will also go into the Greek text and say the words that you're using in terms of, for example, submission means to be responsible to one another, means to align yourself to one another, to partner with one another. So whatever that word means, it means mutual for husbands as well as wives. Headship means like the head of a river. It does not mean I'm going to lord over the woman that I've, that I've been privileged to marry. And by the way, I've been married for 47 years. And we, <laughs> thank you very much. We definitely have times where my wife, Kathy, takes the lead on something that she knows better, she's more skilled at. And there are other times that I'll take the lead of something that I know better. But most of the time we're walking side by side, hand in hand, mutually supporting our marriage. That's what marriage is intended. So, so when the spiritual abuse happens and somebody says, God or Christ wants you to submit, wants you to do things that you don't feel comfortable with emotionally, sexually, physically, uh, that is not appropriate at all. In fact, it's a sin. So, so these are the kind of things that we work with all the time. And the stories that I hear within Christian circles that I don't hear a lot of times in secular circles. My mom and dad used to tell me, and my mom and dad, um, they've been married a long time too. And um, they always said this, um, you know, marriage is 100%, 100%, you know, because uh -huh. a lot of people say, what's well, a 50-50? It's not a 50-50. It's, you know, you give everything 
and your spouse gives everything and then you get you have a strong marriage so um, it's a beautiful way to put it yeah so i guess that's um you know something for our viewers as they're watching um we're going to be showing a number on the bottom of the screen um, for any of our viewers who might be experiencing violence and they need to reach out. Um, so we want to make sure that if this is touching anybody deeply and um, you need help, we want to make sure that you're offered, offered that help. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, let's, let's um, get one more question and then we'll take a quick quick break because I okay. think this is important. Can you separate the facts from commonly held myths mm -hmm. about adult intimate partner violence? Well, well, the, the one that's still uh, being kicked around, I've been doing this work for 35 years, and the one that's still prevalent is that when it's a woman victim survivor, she must have done something to cause the abuse. We have a saying that's not my original saying, and the saying is there's no excuse for abuse, no excuse whatsoever. And sometimes uh, people will point out not only the offender, but some other people will say, well, um, she had a big mouth. She talks so much. She nags him. And I said, if that's even true, there's no excuse for abuse. Uh, people will say to me, um, she drinks too much. And I said, okay, that might be a problem she needs to take a look at and get some help with. But why are you telling me that right now? Well, that's why he abuses her. I said, no, that's not the reason. Uh, we hear ongoing things that the dog barks too much. So if she had control of the dog or the children, then he wouldn't have to abuse her. So these myths still kick around that the victim survivors are doing something or lacking something as to why they're being abused. I go so far as to say, which shocks some Christian pastors, I said, even if she was slipping, sleeping around, he has a right to leave. He has a right to be angry. He has no right to abuse her. There's never any excuse for abuse. Um, the other thing is that, that, the man has just worked so hard and he has so much pressure at work. His bosses are on him all the time or now in the pandemic, uh, they're out of work. So the tension is there. So that's why he's abusive. And I said, there are millions of people out of work who don't abuse anyone. There are millions of people who have a lot of stress, not abusive to anybody. So again, that's an excuse that we, we have to get out of our heads that there's some kind of excuse or justification. The other kind of myth busting that alcohol or drugs, other drugs cause abuse, they can coexist. And some drugs like crystal methamphetamine causes a person to be uh, paranoid. But the reality is that even when people are on ice, crystal methamphetamine, they target certain people. It's not like I'm going and abusing everybody. Even when somebody has an alcohol problem and they say, that's the reason why I abuse my, my wife or my female intimate partner, they're not abusing everybody else. They're not abusing the law enforcement officer, for example. They're not abusing the judge. And I must point out, as a longtime pastor, when they come to see me, it's always very respectful. Reverend Miles, Pastor Miles, they're not abusing me. So, so there, there cannot be the kind of excuses that we have given uh, over the dawn of time. Uh, abuse is wrong and it always is wrong. Is there hope for an abuser? Very good question. Since it's learned behavior, since domestic violence, intimate partner violence is learned, some people learn it in the homes where where the, the father was abusive to the mother. Some learn it from, from the media, from television programs, from magazines. There's all kinds of uh, messages that, that give men the message that it's okay to do what they want to women and children. Uh, since it's learned, it can be unlearned. The experience that I have over the decades is that it takes a lot of energy on the part of a offender to really want to get the help that he needs uh, to stop being abusive and to be a peaceful justice maker in society. 
But to your specific question, absolutely, there is hope. It's just really a difficult um, climb and the offender has to really want to change. Change is hard. For, for those of us who have tried to do anything, change is very difficult. And if a person may not get what he wants with the change by, for instance, as I talked about earlier, my 47 year message, uh, marriage to Kathy, there are times that when we compromise and negotiate, I don't get what I want, but that's a part of the marriage. That's a part of the partnership. So an abuser might say, when I threaten or I raise my voice or I hit my partner, I get what I want. It's not healthy. And they end up a lot of times losing that very partner that they claim they, they needed so much, but they get what they want. And, and so do I really want to make the sacrifice and negotiate and work on a partnership that's 100%, 100%, or do I want to keep getting what I want through means of fear and other tactics? That's a decision that has to be made. But yes, uh, people can change, uh, but it takes a lot of work. The thing I want to say to our pastors listening and, and viewing us is to be very, very wary of somebody saying, God has changed me instantaneously. Mm -hmm. He gets up there, he gives his testimony on a Wednesday night or a Sunday morning, and everybody says, praise the Lord, praise God. That change is suspicious. It's another form, another tactic of manipulation. Now, over time, if somebody gets into a batterer's intervention program, continues the aftercare, works on being nonviolent in society, joins accountability groups with other men who have struggled with, with, with violence and abuse and does that ongoing, I have much more hope and much more believability in that man's um, ability to change and to be a, a peacemaker in our society. But this kind of instantaneous, quick, God has changed me, praise the Lord, everybody claps. Uh, I, I do not trust that in the least bit. Well, I think the important thing here is to remember that what you said, that key word is accountability. Yes. No matter what that sin is, we're trying to um, work our way through. We need to have accountability in our life to make sure that we are not sucked into it again. That's right. So that's right. We, we will uh, take a quick break and go and get your coffee. Um, go <laughs> hug your wife. Um, you know, give your, your cakey a big hug and we will be right back. Aloha, I'm Eva Andrade. I'm the president of Hawaii Family Forum, and we've been serving Hawaii's faith-based community since 1998. What we do is we provide research and education to the faith-based community to help them understand what's happening at the state capitol and what's happening on the issues that affect the families here in Hawaii. If you would like more information, please visit us on the web. But in the meantime, know that Micah 6.8 says that the Lord requires of us to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And we can help you do that, not only to raise your voice the way that the Lord calls us to raise our voice, but to understand the issues on a scriptural basis. And we'll tell you how you can learn more about what's affecting Hawai'i's families. Mahalo. Welcome back. I hope you have your cup of coffee, your iced tea, your iced water. Maybe you did a brisk walk through the kitchen. Um, welcome back. This uh, topic today is a little heavy and we understand that. And again, we want to make sure that for those of you that need um, to some ministry in your life, if you need to reach out, um, we're going to be providing that information on the bottom of the screen. So please don't wait. If there's something happening in your life right now, don't give yourself an excuse that you'll get to it later. Um, if the Lord is moving in you right now, then make that call, um, get that help. Um, and for those of you that maybe are not experiencing violence in your life, you know, take a moment to just say a prayer for the people in your community that are. Um, you know, we need to surround them with with the love of God right now because of things that could be happening in their life. So. 
let's let's dig a little bit deeper um reverend al we know there's this this is one of those those situations that's like an onion you know the more you peel the layers you know it just it it gets more and more tough but how has faith and religion and spirituality helped or hindered victims and survivors mm. of intimate partner violence excellent question eva excellent question um definitely if i as pastor and we have wonderful pastors throughout our state um, if I, as pastor, get the education and training I need on intimate partner violence awareness, that's not something that we teach in seminary normally. It's not something in Bible college. It's something more for agencies uh, in our state, uh, like the uh, Domestic Violence Action Center and the Hawaii State Coalition Against uh, Violence. Those kind of agencies have specific trainers who actually train not only secular leaders, but spiritual leaders. And faith, religion, spirituality can be very helpful when the message from our pastors is that there's no excuse for abuse. Uh, that God loves us, that God created us in God's image, both female and male. So therefore, there's no place for violence and abuse in the household. Those kind of messages will definitely help a victim survivor. If a pastor preaches, teaches on domestic violence awareness, and this is a good time to say that in 2013, in October 2013, I was invited to Riverside Church, the famed church in New York City, and gave a whole sermon on domestic violence awareness. And that's on YouTube as well. Those kind of uh, sermons from the spiritual leaders saying uh, abuse is wrong. We will stand by victim survivors. We support you. We believe you. Faith, religion, spirituality is a very big helpmate in those situations. Of course, now I realize that all these pastors watching this right now are going, oh, wait he came to the church and he preached. What if I want to reach out to, you know, Reverend Al? What if I want Pastor Al to come and speak to? Are, are you open to that if pastors are I'm, interested in having if you If pastors speak? are interested in, in my coming to speak, which many on Oahu and throughout the neighbor islands have done over the years. I've been here for 27 plus years and they have reached out. Uh, the thing that I always um, ask, request, is that before I come to preach or teach in their uh, churches, is that the pastors themselves get ready. And by that, I mean, understand the material. My material and other, there's a lot of wonderful t material written by Christian pastors, other Christian authors on intimate partner violence awareness. Definitely, I would want someone from the state coalition or from the Domestic Violence Action Center to be there because what happens when we open up that door and let's just say pastor smith has me come to speak at his parish suddenly the victim survivors are going to feel safe enough to come up and talk and if the pastor's not ready and if the pastor doesn't know what to say or where to make the referrals uh it's going to cause more angst than it is going to cause support so, so it's, it's very important. When I teach, I always will say, I need to bring along material because people will ask, I'm glad your program is going to do this. People will ask, where do I get the help that I need? Some of the people watching this program right now might not even know that they're a victim survivor. They will say, okay, I know he was mean, but he used to say Satan had a hold of him at that time. Or I knew he was mean, but he always apologized and he'd cry and he'd bring me chocolate and flowers, which is a part of the pattern a lot of times. It's not lasting change. It's, it's a part of the pattern. Suddenly they're watching this program and realize, okay, he calls me names that are not baby and honey and sweetheart. He calls me disgusting, inappropriate names. Or he pushes me. Or he forces himself sexually on me. I am being abused. They need to know where to turn, and that pastor 
needs to be ready. She or he needs to be ready before they they um, start preaching and teaching on uh, intimate partner violence awareness. So yes, I'm happy to help. I'm happy to bring a training. I'm happy to, to join my colleagues in the community, the community of service providers, and come to any church uh, willing uh, to, to, to make this commitment to end violence within the homes. Now, you mentioned um, um, that resources and materials. And at the beginning, I let our viewers know that you've written some books. If, if people are interested in, in getting their hands on your books, where can they go to do that? Because of the world the way it is now and, and technology being so, so out there, um, the easiest way is Amazon.com. Google Reverend Al Miles books or the Reverend Al Miles domestic violence awareness and my books will pop up immediately. So will the sermon from Riverside Church uh, pop up at that time. Uh, they order the book. The books are um, relatively cheap. Some are older, but they're still, they still uh, apply with the various steps to take what to do, what not to do, what to say, what not to say. What are some of the things that, that I can be doing? This is what a lot of Christians ask me. I want to be helpful. I'm not an expert in the field, but what can I do and what should I not do? When I answer that question, which is a good time to talk about it now with our time getting limited, um, do a lot of listening. Listen to what a victim survivor has to say. Believe her or his story. Avoid such things as, I find that hard to believe even though that might be a real shock that I did not know that Bob was that way at all, to express that a victim survivor might say, I'm not being believed. So, so definitely do all the listening, say, I'm sorry, say no one deserves to be abused. The things to try to avoid is, is, is such things a, a lot of well-intentioned Christians want to all of a sudden put on a hat that they don't have the qualifications for to be the counselor. Yep. And I want to speak to pastors specifically. I have written, as you've said, four books. I've written hundreds of articles. I've spoken dozens of times across the country and in Canada on intimate partner violence awareness. I have no qualifications as Reverend Al Miles to be a counselor in domestic violence awareness. I know where to refer people. I have expertise in knowing the dynamics, but it's a whole nother expertise to be a licensed person to provide counseling. And it actually scares me, Eva, because there are, even in 2020, there are a number of pastors who say, oh, I do the counseling, Christian counseling. And I say, I don't know that branch of counseling. Well, it's a Christian perspective. I don't have any problem with the Christian perspective. I have a problem with you counseling if you don't have the licensing and degrees to counsel. So make referrals. That's, that's something that, that you can always help with. And it's not just pastors. It's the lay people. It's the sisters and brothers who sit in the pews with victims and survivors and with offenders a lot of times. When it comes to offenders, definitely send them to places where there are batterer specific help. So batteries intervention groups, again, the coalition and the Domestic Violence Action Center can help make those kind of referrals. Uh, do not get into counseling a batterer. Uh, many pastors will say, well, he came to me. I've never seen a man cry so many real tears. He said he's sorry we had prayer and everything is done. And I said, no, it's not done at all. And sometimes within days, certainly within weeks and months, he goes back to that pattern of abusing his wife, his intimate partner, his children. Uh, this is very complicated work and it's very dangerous work. So it's very important that we make referrals, that we listen, that we believe uh, as pastors, that we know what the scriptures say. Scriptures that are misquoted as I talked about Ephesians 5, uh, please be careful of them saying, I know I can do what I want to do because I'm the head of the household and she must submit to me. 
uh, Ephesians 5, 21 through 33, nine out of those 12 verses are instructions for what husbands need to do. What gets quoted a lot of times is wives need to submit themselves to their husbands because the husbands are the head of the wives. And again, that's misquoted. If they look into the Greek text, it, it's much more mutual and it's not about somebody lording over someone else. So there's a lot of things we can do that can be extremely helpful and things that we can do that can be extremely harmful. And we need to make sure that we do the things that are extremely helpful. I think that that's um, very important advice that you're giving because I do think that sometimes people believe they're doing the right things when they're yes. counseling, counseling yes. someone. And um, I think that they would be absolutely horrified if that person went on to either murder somebody or somebody committed suicide or whatever mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. of something that they said. Um, and the, the, the joke that I've always heard about taking scripture out of context is, you know, when Haman hung himself, the scripture says he went out and hung himself. So, I mean, if somebody just went and took that, that scripture out of context, they could say, well, the Bible is making it clear that you can go hang yourself. That's and right. that is That's definitely right. not what that scripture is about. So, well, well, um, well, we exactly, exactly. Forgive me for talking over you. Uh, Ava. No, no, forgive uh, me. <laughs> it, 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 this is a conversation, but, but it, is, it is very important that we know what the scriptures say. We know the purpose of it. We look into the full background. Pastors will understand the term exegesis to really look into the Greek text and what was said and what was happening at that time so that we won't pull something out of a proper context and give justification. Like I said, there are a number of men who claim Christianity who say that I can do what I want to to my wife because I am the Lord over her. And I said, no, that's not what that scripture say at all. You are to treat the wife totally with respect. You are responsible for the whole household. You are responsible to be tender and loving, just as Christ loved the church. And that's what we need to do with those scriptures when it comes to society as a whole. Even in 2020, women are oftentimes vilified, sexualized, made to be objects where we should talk about equal partnerships and we should talk about equal rights for uh, anything that they need to do to protect themselves, for safety, for peace, for justice, just as men. And, and so when it comes to intimate partner violence, the, in, the imbalance comes a lot of times with, I can do what I want, I can say what I want, I can harm my partner, I can say, she can say no, and I can override that. In the, in the, in the Riverside Sermon, the, the, it's very graphic, and this is a hard subject, but in the Riverside Sermon, a woman went out with her mother and went out with her sister for a dinner. Girls' night out, she called it. The husband, for reasons we don't know, said, come back at 9.30. She came back at a quarter to 10, and the husband said, according to the scriptures, I have to punish you. And he begins to beat her and take his baseball bat and beat her and said, but I had to do that because that's what it says in scripture. Now that's a true uh, sign of blasphemy because it's taken what's meant for good and did harm to someone. And there's nothing in scriptures that even suggests that a man or a woman has a right to do that. But I hear those stories all the time of, I can do what I want to because I'm the Lord of my family, Christ is the Lord, not, not men. So, so it's very important that we get the right message out about intimate partner violence. And I gotta say to you, thank you for your courage to uh, uh, tackle such a bold topic that is hidden within the walls of the church a lot of times. We know it goes on, but people don't wanna talk about it. They don't know how to talk about it. And here you are talking about it and getting the word out, and that's uh, bringing light into darkness. This, this show is called Faith in Politics, and we appreciate um, Pastor Al sharing his mana'o with us on this very, very important topic. And Hawaii Family Forum has been at the legislature many years fighting for victims of domestic violence. Um, we understand that it happens, 
and the church cannot remain silent. In fact, the church should be a place of healing and a place of hope. Absolutely. So as we end this, um, this episode today, we just really want to encourage anyone who has the need to reach out to call that number on the screen and make sure that your questions are answered. And we really appreciate you, um, Pastor Al, so much for sharing your time with us. And for the rest of you, as we always say, we do everything for faith, family, and freedom. So we'll see you next week. Mahalo, everybody. If you liked today's video, don't forget to hit like, share it with a friend, and hit that subscribe button so you'll be notified every time we upload a new video. We really appreciate Kalo TV and their partnership to make this happen. So go ahead and click that button. I know you want to.